Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the first Monday of the month, which means it's time for Monday with the McDougals. But we have an extra special guest today because Dr. McDougal will be interviewing a longtime friend and colleague named Dr. Frank Nealon, who has experience working with Dr. Walter Kepner and the rice diet. And I'm so excited because they're going to be talking about whether or not we can actually cure obesity and other common diseases of lifestyle. Please welcome Dr. McDougal and Dr. Nealon to the show. Thank you both so much for doing this. You know, uh, uh, Chef AJ, this is the first time you've had two doctors interested in diet therapy on the screen at the same time. I'm so excited. This is, this is a unique opportunity. And that's why I wanted to to have uh, Dr. Dr. Nealon come and join us because it's it's a lost art changing people's diets and expecting profound profound results. And of course, this is a man who's had as much, if not more, experience than I've had over the years. And I wanted to uh, to bring his expertise, and he's been kind enough to bring a patient. Uh, Dr. Nealon is a uh, let's see, he'd be about about eighty six years old now. Is that right, Dr. That's Nealon? Not. Yes, sir. I tell you, it really it just goes so fast. I'll be there myself pretty soon. <laughs> and uh, I was in the practice of medicine for many years, uh, worked with uh, the Kempner program for about 16 years, and uh, then continued on with the rice diet for another 10. So he's got, he's got a lot of experience, you know, and plus additional experience on his own dealing uh, with the rice diet. I met Dr. Nealon for the the first time uh, when I visited Durham, North Carolina, I visited the Rice House, which is basically a house with a bunch of people living in it. And um, I had a chance to meet him there. And the ne next two times I had a chance to meet him, he was kind enough to come out to our advanced study weekend and to give give some presentations. And you'll find, at, I believe it was once or twice I had you. I, I, I think once that I came. John. All right, an excellent presentation on, uh, on some of his work. There's also a, a description of his mentor, uh, Dr. Kepner. And you know, in, in part, I've invited Dr. Nealon to share with us because Dr. Kepner would never share. He wouldn't allow pictures, he wouldn't allow videos. Uh, he had you know, he had an interesting life that only his uh, apostles would be able to tell us about him. But I'd like to start out by, uh, by asking you, Dr. Nealon, how, how did you get uh, to be a renegade? How did you get away from the medical business and, and the type of training that you and I basically got? Was there yeah. an instrumental event or a person? Yeah, there, well, there, there, there's a backstory, of course, you know, that leads up to it. And, you know, I came to uh, Duke University in 1962 as an intern in the Department of Medicine there. And uh, at the time, Dr. Kempner was in his practice heyday. And so I had a month of working with Dr. Kempner and his patients. And even at that early stage, I was impressed to see people who had a stroke because of hypertension 20 years before. They'd come back to get checked in, and there would be no signs of any residual from their stroke and no signs of hypertension, and everything had got better, and they were not taking medications or doing anything else. So that left a kind of lasting impression on me. Uh, then over the years, I got deeply involved in medical science. I became an endocrinologist and, and spent also a lot of time in general internal medicine. So I ended up taking care of a lot of Dr. Kepner's patients that needed consultations in endocrinology, for instance. Then in 1996, uh, Duke University decided that they were going to return to a managed care system. So I would be seeing patients under the guise of their uh, managed care activities. And I'd done that once before and said, I'm not ever going to do this again. Because I thought the managed care as it was constructed then really interfered with the ability to relate properly to patients. And as a result, I, uh, I then looked around for a place where I could hang my hat. And uh, by that time, Dr. Kempner had retired from active practice, although he was uh, still in the background. Uh, Dr. Robert Rosati was running the rice diet uh, program. And so I asked Dr. Rosati if I could come work with him. He said, yes. And so in 1996, I transferred my activities from Duke University to the rice diet program and essentially finished out my career working with rice diet patients. So that's how that happened. 
you know, I don't think many people really understand how they're being cared for in terms of managed care. Uh, Dr. Lim, who is my medical director, he always talks about how he was trained. He was trained about 10 years ago as a family practitioner, how he was trained to manage patients. And he said he's so glad now that he doesn't have to manage patients anymore. And, you know, even the, even the drug companies talk about managing their patients, but, but they don't, the public, the general consumer doesn't understand is this is a, just a matter of switching you from one brand of drug to another, yeah. you know, from one pharmaceutical company to another with a virtually the, the same type of, uh, of effects and side effects. So uh, doctors who never take you off medication, they're too afraid and they wouldn't do anything as radical as uh, insisting that diet had something to do with illness. So just to get you started there, um, in, your, in your early career, you, you met with Dr. Kemper and I know I, I hear lots and lots of stories about him and maybe we'll get into some of them, but one, one of the things I heard was that he didn't keep medical records. And well, he got in, he got into big trouble, didn't he, for not keeping well, medical records? Yes. Well, he did get into trouble. And Dr. Kempner came, uh, and we're going to review a little bit of that history as we go along, but Dr. Kempner came from Germany, and uh, he spoke very good but thickly accented English. He was very fluent, actually. Uh, he read all of Shakespeare in English, for instance, but his, his speech was was uh, was thickly accented and he was very aloof. He did not socialize with the rest of the Duke faculty. And so he generated a lot of animosity. And early in the days of the Rice Diet, when he really didn't know how much effect a radical restriction in diet would have on patients, many of whom were in fact desperately ill. Uh, so he would ha hospitalize his patients initially and then keeping them in the hospital sometimes for several weeks before he discharged them. It was, it was a different time in hospitalized medicine than it is now, and so we could do that. But a lot of the rest of the faculty, I think, chafed under the fact that so many of the hospital beds were being occupied by Dr. Kempner's patients. In any case, in 1947, Eugene Stead was appointed the third professor of medicine at Duke, and he was the chief of the department, and he came from Emory University. And he told me personally that when he got to Duke, he was surprised to find that one of his first tasks was to fire that obnoxious Dr. Kempner. And he said, well, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. That wasn't part of the original uh, program, but uh, tell me why I should fire him. And they said, well, for one thing, he keeps terrible medical notes. And he thought, well, I'm going to fire a people who doesn't keep good notes. I better go see what he does. So he went in person to see Dr. Kempner in the Rice House, uh, where he was taking care of these patients and keeping his notes. And when he came back, he said, Dr. Kempner's notes are different than the ones you make, but they are the best I have ever seen. And I'm going to promote him to full professor, which he did in which Dr. Kempner never forgot. He remained a lifelong devotee of Dr. Stead because he recognized the value of those records. And I should say, just as an aside, uh, in, in the last two or three years, we have undertaken a project to resurrect all those notes, all those records that Dr. Kempner kept so meticulously. We've had them transcribed into digital format and now we can be begin to analyze the res results of Dr. Kempner's diet using modern analytical techniques that weren't available for Dr. Kempner. So the records remain viable and alive and in action right now. Yeah, uh, he wasn't understood to say the least. Uh, one of the questions, uh, let, let me first define the Kempner diet and you can correct me if I yeah. leave anything out. So. Basically, a diet of white rice, and we'll get into why it was white rice as opposed to brown. And uh, fruits, fruit juices, and a table sugar with a vitamin supplement. Yes. And uh, that that was that was the rice diet. Um, do, do you know how he decided that it would be rice instead of potatoes? I mean, good grief. Yes, okay. uh, Kempner was a very good scientist, and he analyzed all these various uh, proteins uh, that were available. It was very low protein, but he wanted to make sure it was good quality protein. He decided rice protein was as effective as anything that he could come up with. 
that we did it based on the protein content, the amino acid content of the proteins, what they were constructed of. Uh, and then he chose fruit because they're very low in sodium and white rice is very low in sodium. And his goal was to lower sodium. We'll see that in a few minutes when I talk about a case that I'm gonna discuss with you. Uh, but it was, it, his goal was to lower sodium to the lowest possible content that he, he could get. And so he chose rice and fruit. Many of the patients that he saw initially were underweight, even wasted. So he tried to get calories into them. And so to get extra calories, if they needed it, he would add sugar, sucrose. Uh, as patients got better, he would then transition to more vegetables besides just fruit. And even eventually he might add small amounts of animal protein, particularly fish, occasionally chicken, uh, not very much, but he would do that. And his goal always was to help the patient's health problems that they, they were under consideration. Can you give us uh, some general attitude about how the patients felt about Dr. Kempner? Uh, and as opposed to the, the medical community, the medical staff, I, you know, yes, I, I'd, like, uh, I'd like to, you know, how, how did his patients like him? Do they think he's- Well, you know, guy? I don't know if there's anyone who has, has ever done a, a you know, a, a random survey of how they felt. We know that many of the patients, because looking through those records to get a Dr. Kempner's medical notes, there's lots of correspondence in the files, all is kept in the archives at Duke University. And so we've seen letter after letter of people, sometimes of very great note, commenting on Dr. Kenner's care and how much they'd benefited from coming to the program. Uh, in the latter years, when I was working at the Rice Diet Program, after Dr. Kempner had died, one of the patients that had been there with him would come and say, you know, I still remember Dr. Kempner saying to me, you are a stupid man, because he wouldn't adhere as religiously to the program as he needed to go. But he said it with great affection. I think now people who didn't like Dr. Kempner probably just took off and left. I don't want to say that everyone loved him. He was a strict disciplinarian. It was his way or the highway, no question. Uh, but they recognized that he was dealing with problems. Benny, and, and, and we'll see that in a moment, I think. But initially, the patients that he took were people with untreatable. There were no known treatments for this very severe form of high blood pressure called the malignant hypertension. And the malignant comes not because it has anything to do with cancer, which it doesn't, but because it's so deadly. The median survival of people with malignant hypertension in 1939 was 5.4 months. And that's much shorter than most cancers. Most people with cancer live much longer than that. So it was an extremely lethal form and Dr. Kempner began to treat it and showed success in that treatment. So I think the people understood that he was dedicated to their health. And from even when he was taking care of people who were obese and wanted to lose weight, he never took it as a cosmetic problem. He always said, We're not, our goal is not to make you look better, although in fact you will look better. Our goal is to make you healthier. And that was his, always his thrust. This was a medical treatment. In the Rice House, he came to the Rice House every single morning, seven days a week. Uh, he had this Germanic notion about the summer and he would take the summer off. So for three months, he was gone from Durham. But he, the other nine months, he was there every morning at the Rice House to see patients every single morning. And so they understood his dedication to what was going on and how carefully he analyzed what was happening and how he prescribed for their health. Well, I, I, I just get the feeling that our colleagues were recognized his genius, but were also a little bit, a little bit frightened because they could do, couldn't understand what this man was doing and posed somewhat of a threat to their practice. Yeah. Yeah, I must say there were many people who criticized the rice diet from the professional side. And I don't think any of them ever came to look at the rice house. You came and visited us there. I remember that visit. Your son was in graduate school at North Carolina and you stopped by to see us. Uh, but uh, very few of these critics ever came to see what was happening. And that's why I respect Dr. Stead. He got this report of bad notes. He said, I better go look and see what they're like. So he went to see. Very few people ever did that. Well, I, I, I do recall a paper, uh, I believe that 
investigator's name was was Rice or maybe not. But anyway, they, they investigated him and they took a, a group of his patients, like seven or eight of them, put them in a metabolic ward to try and determine that they had nutritional deficiencies or something was wrong with them. And when they published the paper, they had nothing but glowing things to say. So when colleagues did take a look at Dr. Kemper's work, it was uh, not not to prove it was it was uh, effective, but they ended up walking away finding it was not only not only well, highly effective but safe. One thing I will say about the rice diet is that people did try it. When he published his first results, people tried to get people to eat rice and fruit, and they said, "Go home and eat rice and fruit." And what Dr. Kemner ended up doing is say, come and stay in Durham for weeks and months, even years, and eat rice and fruit and let me see you every day. No one else did that. So when they told patients to go home and eat rice and fruit, they eat a little rice and a little fruit and a little of everything else. And that did not work. And so they said the rice diet doesn't work in practical terms. And I you know, have to guess that that's so. Uh, but Dr. Kemner's approach was to have people in residence. He thought that was in, important to do. Yeah, and of course, I, I would agree with that, and I'm sure you would too. People need an awful lot of support when they first start out. Would you like to tell us about the patient that you brought? Yes, I would. Uh, yeah, I, and let me, if I can, I'm going to share my screen so that I can uh, show you a few slides about this, and we can chat along the way. And I hope you'll interrupt and question me if you if I don't make sense to what we're saying and doing. Uh, Let's see if we can get this started. Okay. So uh, th this is a little capsule uh, history about Dr. Kemmer. He was born in 1903. Uh, he started medical school in Berlin, but he graduated at Heidelberg and then became a uh, young researcher in the laboratory of Dr. Otto Warburg, who was a famous Nobel Prize laureate in Berlin. Now, when the Nazis came to power, you know, Kempner, like all other Jews, was at risk. And so the Rockefeller Foundation, who had recognized this risk to Jewish scientists in Germany, had started a program to try and rescue them. And the Rockefeller Foundation, in addition, had a strong relationship with the young fledgling school at Duke University, which had started in 1930. And so they arranged for Kempner to get a position at Duke and he came there in 1934. Uh, and in 1939, uh, Dr. Kempner, like all other doctors at Duke with MD degrees, had to make rounds on the wards with the students teaching uh, about patients. And he complained about the ignorance of doctors who did not understand kidney disease and high blood pressure. And the students, although they were probably not quite this irreverent, said to him effectively, well, if you're so smart, why don't you show how to do it? And he decided he would. And he began to treat patients with severe hypertension, malignant hypertension and kidney disease. And he did it with this diet he devised of rice, fruit, sugar. Uh, and he was surprised himself at the magnitude of the results and then went on to use that and the diet itself consists of white rice and fruit, as we've said, other vegetables added as the patient's condition improved. Complex carbohydrates provided about 90% of calories in this diet with 5% of, as, of calories as fat and 5% as protein. Now, as their condition improved and he added more vegetables and you add beans and legumes, you can easily get up to 25% of the calories as uh, protein, but nevertheless, they'd always provided at least 70% of your calories as carbohydrate. Uh, the, the other important thing was that the sodium contact was vanishingly low. We think about the fact that modern Americans eat about 3,500 milligrams of sodium a day. And if they're told to go on a low sodium diet, the dietitian will prescribe about 2,000 milligrams a day. And Dr. Kempner was feeding these patients 100 milligrams a day. Uh, I should say here too, that's a reason why potentially the rice diet can be uh, uh, treacherous because if you cannot retain maximal amounts of sodium, 100 milligrams a day may be too low. 
So if you undertake the rice diet, you should not just eat rice and fruit, even supplemented with vitamins as Dr. Kempner recognized was important to do, you still may get sodium depleted. So you do not want to do that at home. You can eat rice, fruits, grains, and vegetables, especially if you have small supplemental amounts of, of, uh, of sodium. Uh, you can easily get by on 500 milligrams a day. We think back about our prehistoric ancestors and what kind of diet they could have eaten. They probably did not get more than at most five or 600 milligrams of sodium a day. So the body seems well designed to operate on that amount. But you should not eat just rice and fruit on your own without careful, knowledgeable medical supervision. Let me, let me stop you for a minute because sure. I, I'm sure you brought up a lot of concern for people. Because yeah. I talk about the rice diet a little more casually than that. Right. Of course, I don't yeah. wash the rice and I, right. you know, I, I don't go to those kinds of extremes. But have you actually seen anybody who's gotten into trouble due to low sodium? I, I rarely I have. And the people that, that we saw that got in trouble are people that have this peculiar con condition called the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. And this means that you cannot put out maximally dilute urine no matter what. And as a result, they retain some water and that can dilute the sodium in the blood. And if you get your sodium content low, they can get in trouble. We saw people who had full colostomies and had an ileostomy with a bag. They can't absorb the amount, 10 or 15% of the sodium we eat gets reabsorbed by the colon. And that could make a difference. It was very rare, I have to say that, but it is a very dangerous condition to have your blood level of sodium get too low. We want the amount going through your body every day to be low, but we want the blood level to stay constant. So we usually recommend that people do not try and get their sodium down to 100 milligrams a day. Right, which is which is what he did in this clinic. Yes, practice. that's what he did. And we'll see why in a minute. You know, sometimes I get, a, I get a couple of criticisms and maybe now would be the good time to bring it up. Yeah. Um, one is uh, I do feed people a little bit of sodium, but I also yeah. understand Dr. Kempner's extreme reductions, you know, from the basic food to 500 milligrams down yeah. to maybe we'll, 100 we'll, milligrams. You know, we are gonna look in just a minute at why Dr. Kemner invented the rice diet and we got the sodium down that wall. Well, I was gonna ask you, from, from your experience, do you ever get into the argument that people need a little bit of salt and maybe this uh, infatuation, except under clinical circumstances, like with Dr. Kemner, where he's dealing with people with morbid hypertension and you know, yeah. end-stage kidney disease and so on. Uh, can you think of an argument where the average citizen walking around might be better off adding a little salt to their diet? Well, <laughs> you know, 2,300 a milligrams. Little, a little. Uh, 2,300 milligrams today is a teaspoon of salt. It's not much. You know, you start doing that in 24 hours and, and putting in food and buying commercial food, you can rapidly ramp the sodium content up. Okay. So I would have no objection. And, and uh, people would ask Dr. Kempner because as we're gonna see in a minute, uh, for, uh, he did use the rice diet for weight control and weight loss. When he did that, he would restrict calories. He did not necessarily restrict calories who people came already with a BMI of 21 and were wasted. He wanted to get calories in them. But if they were already obese and they needed to lose weight, he would restrict calories. Otherwise, not. Uh, I think if people eat 500 milligrams a day, that would be fine. Patients would ask Dr. Kepner, listen, Dr. Kepner, I do not have severe hypertension. I don't even have high blood pressure at all. I'm here for other reasons. Why can't I add sodium? Kepner's response was, you know, I've carefully studied this diet and I know that it works. If you want to devise your own diet and find out, does it work with higher amounts of sodium? You are entirely welcome to do it. But if you want to come to Durham and be with me, you must eat the rice diet. So he did not want to investigate that. Uh, we can talk a little bit more when we look at my patient about okay. the effect of sodium on hypertension. And there's some other things we can say about it. And it may, as I say, if I had my brothers, I would aim for five to 700 milligrams a day. Do I know that's better than Kemner's? I do not, because I haven't done the studies, but I think that it would be reasonable to aim for that. Well, just your comment that the, you know, the usual traditional diet 
that people follow for you know, many hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, yes. He has about five, six, 700 milligrams of sodium in it. But of course, there were extremes where people ate a lot more sodium than that when they lived by the seaside. Right. But it doesn't seem to be, I, I just want people to understand this is a therapeutic diet that Dr. Kemper was putting people through. And people who had very, very serious illnesses and and they needed a, a little extra help. Although, yes. yeah. The other thing, I don't know whether you'd like to get into this later or not. Because I have favored, you know, I, I probably put it this way, Dr. Kempner taught me more about diet therapy than any of my other mentors. I learned lots of things from different mentors. Uh-huh. But you know, I've embraced the idea that uh, simple sugar is, is part of the therapeutic diet. And uh, people do criticize me for that. Not that I use simple sugar in terms of the routine care of people, but you know, I, I talk about, about foods being lower in protein, being healthier. And that what we want to do is we want to avoid the, the extra protein. And the only way to do that is to add more carbohydrate, particularly simple carbohydrate. Do you, do you understand why, why people look at me a little bit, a glance and, you know, McDougal, what you, you recommend, you know, this vegetarian diet and starches and so on, but you all, you're recommending sugar. Well, I, you know, I, people worry about simple sugars, and I don't know, Dr. Kempner didn't worry about it again. I don't think he studied that either. He just said it's calories, it's pure carbohydrate. He gave that to them. Uh, did you have problems with rotten teeth? No, not that I know of. I mean, people did not have, you know, full dentures when they came to see me. You have to be on the rice diet for 20 years. So I don't think so. And I, it never came up as an issue. All right. Well, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's something... Uh, Dr. Neela, that I have to live with, and I don't have any problem with it, is the fact that, you know, I don't think sugar is the bad guy like so many other people do, even though, you know, it does rot teeth and raises triglycerides and it's empty calories, and there's a lot better sources of calories than sugar. Well, let's keep this question about sugar in mind, because I think there's a place that we are going to see in just a minute. Let me me have you move along then. Okay, so... Anyhow, I want to just say, William Osler, the father of medical education in this country as we know it, once said, we should have no teaching without a patient for a text. And I'm going to use a patient for a text, and I'm going to ask us to look closely at the medical case of this patient that came to the Rice Diet, as you'll see, in 2011. He actually had been there in 1985 for a brief visit when he was much overweight, and he wanted to lose weight. And at that time, his blood pressure and his blood sugar were kind of borderline, but they rapidly went back to normal. And when he left, he went back home and he rapidly went back to normal too, eating what he ate before. And we'll see the results of that in a few minutes. Uh, So anyhow, this patient has kindly given us permission to review his case and the case history, to show his photographs, although he's asked that his face be blanked out. So we've done that. And then we've asked that we not use his name. And I had thought that maybe we could call him patient Lazarus because although he was not actually in the grave, as you'll see, he had one foot on the edge and he came back from that. But he said patient X, so we'll call him patient X from now on. So here is patient X when he came in May of 2011. And at that time, his weight was 435 pounds He was 68 inches tall. His body mass index, which as we're going to see is a rough but rather helpful idea about how much excess weight we've got on board was 66. His blood pressure was 196 over 120. And his blood sugar was 295 milligrams per deciliter, which is very high. So, Dr. Kempner's first goal for the rice diet was to treat hypertension, particularly severe hypertension. Now, our patient did have severe hypertension, but fortunately he did not have the kind of vascular changes in the eye that will allow us to diagnose malignant hypertension, but he wasn't far away from that. And at the time Dr. Kempner started, there were no known drugs that would lower blood pressure. And there were no other effective treatments. Some people had tried you know, severing the nerves you know, from the sympathetic uh, nervous system along the spinal cord to see if that would lower blood pressure because the nerves do control the contraction of blood vessels. 
And it did lower the blood pressure when you stood up. In fact, it got so low, many patients would faint and fall to the ground. But once they got to the ground and were flat, the blood pressure went right back up to a high level. So it was a dangerous operation, lots of side effects, and it really didn't help. And as I said earlier, most patients with severe hypertension, with no treatment in 1939, the average lifespan was 5.4 months. Now our patient's blood pressure was surely high, 196 over 120, which is severe. And not only that, he was already taking four potent antihypertensive medications, aliskarin, metoprolol, and laudapine and benazepril. Perfectly good drugs. He was taking them in full doses and his blood pressure was 196 over 120. So we did what Dr. Kempner said, let's get on the rice diet. And when we did, he began his decline in blood pressure. And you can see here the fall in blood pressure, looking at the target blood pressure of 130 systolic or below. 140 is not bad, but the target these days is 130. And you can see that he had a rapid decline in blood pressure so that on day 12, we could stop his aliskarin. Blood pressure did not go up. We stopped metoprolol. Maybe the blood pressure bounced a little, but it came right back down. By day 43, we'd got rid of amlodipine. And on day 54, we'd gotten rid of benazepril. Now, I'd like to say that from then on, he never had to take any antihypertensive drugs. But back home, when it's hard to be as careful about sodium and in your intake as it is here, his blood pressure did go up a little and he got back on a tiny dose of one of those drugs as we'll see. But with that, he's been under very good control. And like you, I think we should not take any drug at all that we don't have to take. And when we do have to take it, it should be in the lowest possible dose we have to take for the shortest possible time we have to take. But I don't wanna be a complete nihilist and say you should never take a drug ever for any reason. You should just make sure you have to do it because that's all you can do. So anyhow, as you see, we're gonna get a very good blood pressure outcome from this patient. Now, after 1960, the drug companies became deeply involved with drugs that will treat hypertension. I just showed you four, and there are probably 10 others that we could have put on that list too, past or present, that have been used for treating high blood pressure. They do work, they do lower blood pressure. Uh, and if you don't do anything else, get your blood pressure down. Because I think the mischief from blood pressure comes from the pressure. So you want to lower it. Um, so anyhow, Dr. Kemner was faced with that. And he took advantage of the fact that it was easy to lose weight on the rice diet. As I say, he had to add sugar to the formula for his early patients in order to get their calorie amounts up in. So... Our patient had extreme obesity. His initial body mass index is 66. We'll look at what that means in just a minute. So here's the, the graph of his curve of weight. And we see here the, the rankings of body mass index. And these are very arbitrary as far as I'm concerned. Uh, up to a body mass in index of 25 is considered, quotes, normal. Whether it's optimal, that we can decide. From 25 to 30 is considered overweight. That puts you at more risk for various diseases. And then we have these categories of obesity. Class one is 30 to 35 BMI. Class two is 35 to 40 BMI. Class three is anything over 40. And you can see he is up here in the stratosphere with a BMI of 66. And it came down very rapidly over a period now of two years, he's below the obesity level and he's leveled off in here at a range just below that. His BMI now is about 29. Am I happy with that number? In the abstract, I'm not. And I have told him many times, I would like to have him down here in the white zone. Uh, but success does have some argument and it's just hard to fly in the face of success. So we'll look at that and we'll come back to this point again at the end. But nevertheless, he rapidly changed. So in the course of two years, he was no longer obese. It does take a long time. People forget that. The first course is rapid and then it tends to slow down as it must. 
the physics of weight loss, they're going to say this is going to be a slowing down process. But if we look right here at this beginning thing in, a, in bigger magnification, we can see this curve of his weight loss. His weight loss is coming down and down and down and down. But at one point, right here, he deviates from the expected curve downward of his BMI. And there's this inflection point here. And the question is, what happened? Why didn't this not? He's not deviated a bit. And now he does deviate. So the difference is right here, he left Durham and went back home. He lives outside the state. Now he went home fully armed and dedicated to the proposition he was going to take care of himself with his diet. So we reviewed with him, what was he doing at home? What was he eating? Just what was prescribed by the rice diet. How about exercise? He exercised and has faithfully one hour a day, walking or riding a bicycle for one hour every single day. And I think that's important, but he was faithful about it. What could he be doing? Finally, our dietitian suggested, why don't you ask him whether he's measuring the amount of food he takes? The answer was no, he was estimating the amount. We said, well, why don't you try going back and actually measuring? If it says a cup of rice, which is the usual dose we gave, a cup of boiled rice, by the way, not of unboiled. And when he started measuring again, he just got right back on the curve and stayed on it ever since. So my lesson, takeaway lesson from this curve is just being good is not good enough. You actually have to measure to be sure. And I think most people don't do that. And if you eat out, you know you're not getting measurement. But I don't think it's possible for humans to accurately estimate portion size. And the mistakes we make are always on the large side rather than the small. Would you agree with that, John? Yeah, I would. Uh, it's um, Well, we won't get into uh, Dr. Kempner's uh, famous statement about dieters. But if you feel like saying it sometime, <laughs> <laughs> you, you you could say I don't I don't I usually don't get away, away with it. Somebody says that's I don't. A yeah, but he did he did say, and this was recorded in print, that all doc dieters are liars. And <laughs> I don't know that he meant that they were consciously lying. They went out and said, "I'm going to eat two cups of whatever food, or I'm going to eat a big steak and not tell you about it." Yeah. Even when they tried to tell the truth, they couldn't tell the truth because they can't see it. You have to measure it. Well, I, I think that's the case. I, not necessarily that patients lie to. The dietitian or to the doctor. It's just that they have people have a way of justifying things, and you know what is apparent to say somebody looking at it objectively is not apparent to the to the person who's sitting down to the meal. Somehow or another, that cake just disappears. Yeah. Well, I, I remember seeing a study once where uh, one some psychologist said to patients, uh, "Pour a cup of rice in this bowl." which they did. Then they measured how much it was and it turned out to be about a cup and a half. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what happens. Our vision plays tricks on us. Uh, there's, there's a statement uh, that, that uh, uh, may there be some value here that was ascribed to the uh, English uh, physicist Rutherford who said, if all else fails, measure something. And I think in this case, measurement made a big difference. Anyhow, he has been successful in maintaining his weight for the past nine years, uh, although it's a little higher than I would say, but you know, I, we're gonna look at why it's hard to be too. Okay, can I stop you here for just a minute? Sure. This is something that comes up with yep. my practice a lot is people will, <clears throat> they'll lose that initial 100, 120 pounds yeah. and they'll get down to the last 20 or 30 pounds yeah. And they'll say, I, I just can't lose it. And I give them some flimsy excuses, like yeah. if you exercise more or you follow the maximum weight yeah. loss program more. Also, they're carrying around a lot of muscle, a lot of skin. They are. You know, yeah. what, do you, what do you effectively tell people? Because they, they want to get down that last 20 pounds. Yeah. And somehow, somehow my offerings fall short for them. And I wish I, I wish I would like some guidance. Well, you know, the first thing I would say is you can try the measuring technique, okay, and say, make sure that they're actually getting as many calories in as you want. Right. Second thing is that exercise is critically important for health. And I think 
part of my uh, patient X's success has been his faithful dedication to daily exercise in substantial amounts every day. Uh, but it's, it's a paradox, but exercise to lose weight does not work. Exercise to improve health, very helpful. Exercise to lose weight has a short-term effect, but as you become adapted to your exercise, your body becomes more efficient. You need fewer calories to use that exercise efficient machine. So unless you increase the amount of exercise every day, I don't think it really is going to be much help. It's important for your health. I don't tell people not to exercise. They should. But as a weight loss mechanism, it has a transitory effect. So my guess is if they're at that low level, you have to look and see what the calorie balance in, in is, is and whether it's accurate. Well, I always resort to, you know, the, the, the theory of uh, thermodynamics and that is calories in versus calories out. But that doesn't seem to, to help the people who are struggling with that last well, 50, 20, 30 you know, pounds. But I like, the, I like the idea of measuring it, but that gets back to what Dr. Walter Kettner said, that dieters are often not accurate as to what they say. Uh, yes, but I, I don't think it's conscious lying, okay? Uh, and no, that I, is, I don't think they're going to measure out a cup and a half and say, well, I'm going to call that a cup in my house. Right, right. It makes it a lot harder to, to mislead yourself, if you will. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll suggest that. I, 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 that's <laughs> something I haven't resorted to enough. Yeah. Is you know, Well, you know, actually, there have been times in my career when I have, Dr. Neelan, and I would send people home and have them do a diary, and that seemed to help a lot. Yeah. But, um, well, uh, you know, this, uh, like this, this law of thermodynamics, I don't say is contravened. No one thinks that's happening. But my colleague at Duke, Herman Ponsner, studies primitive hunter-gatherer tribes in Africa. Now, and there are tribes that live hunter-gatherer lifestyles. They are surrounded by civilization. They reject it. They walk 18 to 21 miles a day. And he measures their body fat content and their calorie intake. And it turns out that they do not eat enormous amounts of calorie to maintain that exercise regimen. They eat what everyone else, about 2,000 to 2,500 calories a day. They are just enormously more efficient in how they use those calories. Is okay, that so in, gonna, the Maasai, yeah. in, in Maasai in Africa? Uh, you know, he has, he has a group that he works with. I do not know, uh, unfortunately, what their uh, yeah, tribal I've heard, that, I've heard that before, too. And that's, you know, again, some consolation to people to tell them they have a much more efficient metabolism. And they do. I mean, good grief. They've been carrying around an extra 100, 150 that's pounds. That's right. That's right. For the right. last 10 years, they build out of, of a very efficient system. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think there's any, there's any... We do not want to shortchange exercise. No one should be sitting on the couch all the time. The exercise is important. We're going to see that, I think, in a minute. Let's look at his diabetes, okay? Uh, many people think that diabetes is a sugar disease because, in fact, the blood sugar is elevated. But, in fact, it's a global metabolism disease. The argument of this first statement, though, is that since sugar is a carbohydrate, is the assumption that sugar and all other carbohydrates will be bad for diabetes, and a little appreciated fact is that complex carbohydrates like the rice diet are in fact remarkably beneficial in type two diabetes. And there's no doubt that our patient had diabetes. His fasting blood sugar was 295 with a normal of 100 or less. His hemoglobin A1C, which is a long-term reflection of sugar. It's in fact, the sugar that is chemically attached to the hemoglobin, the red protein in our red blood cells. It's what makes blood red. And so the sugar that's attached chemically here was 10.7 with a normal of less than 5.6. And despite all these things, he was taking three potent drugs for blood sugar, metformin, citagliptin, and exenatide, which he had to inject twice a day. And what stimulated him to come back to the rice diet was the suggestion that maybe we should go to insulin. And the idea of injecting insulin, even though he was injecting exenatide, insulin just triggered him. He said, I'm going back to the rice diet. So whatever reason, he came to see us. So if we look at what happened to his long-term sugar re results with hemoglobin A1C as the measure of sugar, 
he started with this very high level. And here's the ranges of hemoglobin A1C. There's a normal range up to 5.6. There's this range that calls sort of euphemistically pre-diabetes. It's the danger range. If your sugar's here, you're more likely to transition into a definitely high range of 6.5 and above. And the higher you are, the worse their sugar range. So here he is with a hemoglobin of A1C, which says his average blood sugar throughout the day is over 300, and it should be somewhere around 117. Now the blue line shows the theoretical curve of what should happen if on day one of starting a treatment, you instantaneously change your blood sugar from 300 to 100 or 300 to 90. If you had instantaneous correction from then on, your hemoglobin A1C should fall according to this line and then stay at a normal range of about 5.2. And here's what our patient's hemoglobin A1C did. It came down and down and down and down and out of the diabetic range and then into the normal range. And the best thing of all is that we stopped all of his drugs back here. So all of this has been accomplished without the benefit of any drugs. Now, I think exercise helps this a lot. So that's the reason, my guess, why he looks so good. He's got his, his BMI is higher than we want to be, but his exercise has stayed faithfully up. Dr. Nealon, this again brings in uh, some concern that I particularly have with the whole medical business. Yeah. You were, you were uh, comfortable enough, not, not just wise enough, but comfortable enough to stop three powerful diabetic medications. In a diabetic, many people uh, inadequately educated would think that the patient was gonna get into trouble when in truth, you could do nothing but good by stopping the medication. But you know, my colleagues are afraid to do this. As I say, they just manage patients. They're, yeah. they're afraid to take people. And if, if you wouldn't have taken this patient off the medications, just think what would happened to the blood sugar as he made his correction. Overnight, by the way, made his correction. Oh it surprises God. people when I tell them I'll stop a patient from taking 100, 120 units of insulin a day, like day one. Well, my only regret about patient X is that we weren't smart enough to stop it here. Yeah. And we just, we, we try to hedge our bets. If people are taking insulin, we know enough to say, cut your dose in half on day one. But when they're not taking insulin and we thought, well, these drugs are going to be okay. We can watch them. And then we've got a little more time. We waited two or three months. And as you're going to see in a minute, that was a mistake. I mean, I learned most of what I learned. I learned from the patients who teach me about it. This patient te taught me an explicit lesson about what you've just said. But in any case, his blood sugar stayed down beautifully. But I want to look at this early stage here. So if we look at that area, we say, here's the, the line that shows the theoretical ideal fall of A1C with perfect correction of blood sugar on day one. And his curve deviates slightly. His blood sugar was a little bit slower than perfection, but it comes down almost parallel after a few months to this other curve to get to the normal range. And if we look very, really closely at this region, we see right up here, these three values. If we take this value and this value and this value and draw an arrow from them, we see that it goes back through day zero, which means to me that this patient's blood sugar began to get better as soon as he began to eat properly. And the properly was not avoiding carbohydrates, but eating the right number of calories. Patient X was taking a thousand calories a day, limited, of rice, fruits, grains, and vegetables. And it looks like his blood sugar, and we've seen this many, many times, it gets better as soon as you start eating right. Here's another look at it. Here's his weight loss curve again. We've already seen that same thing. If we take this early part and plot it versus his A1C, you can see that here's his BMI coming down Here's the values for BMI. Here's his A1C coming down. Right here at this point, his BMI is still 50. No one is going to argue that that's obese. His blood A1C is now less than 6.4 and stays less than 6.4.
he can no longer be diagnosed with diabetes, although he's tremendously obese still. It, you know, people would say that obesity causes diabetes. It does not cause diabetes. That's the first thing to keep in mind. Obesity is an indicator of the condition that is causing both obesity and diabetes, but they are not caused by one another. They're caused by a common cause that gets better starting on day one. As the way, soon as you start eating. I did, but I'm sorry to interject, but the way I would, I would look at this thing is that once on day one, you stop feeding the fats and oils, then you stop paralyzing the insulin. And on day one, when you feed a diet that's 93% sugar, carbohydrate is the Kemper diet is, you've increased, <clears throat> you've increased the insulin sensitivity. The cells become extremely sensitive to what insulin is available. So the biochemical changes occur within hours. And that's why they don't. you and I and any other doctor who attempted this needs to be ready to stop the diabetic pills and the insulin in a type two diabetic like now, not it's months it's later or weeks later when they fall in the mashed potatoes. Yeah. Uh, well, the good thing about the rice house, we saw people every single day. Yeah, you did. And for months at a time. So we could watch the sugar and watch that happen. So we thought we had a little more time, but you'll see in a minute, we were not as smart as we thought. Well, one, so thing, I, I, one thing I'd like to add here, again, you're, you're getting me out of some kind of dilemmas <laughs> that I've been involved in is that, you know, somebody will, well, first of all, they get upset because the blood sugar will go up after their first meal. Well, yeah. they just stopped a whole bunch of diabetic pills. They went off a low carb diet and they ate. So the blood sugar should go up. And then what happens is they get better over the, say the next few days and then the few, next few weeks. And they say, well, you know, it's still not, I'm not type two purely, I'm type one and a half. And, you know, <laughs> I still, don't you think though, that eventually if they lose that trim weight, that extra body fat, that even that will correct in most cases. I guess what I'm trying to say, is I agree with you 100% that, you know, fat's not what causes diabetes, it's the, the fat you eat. And Body fat, yes, that's right. right. No. Uh, and, but don't you think uh, later on, later on in life, like, you know, uh, 60, 80, 100 pounds down, when, don't you think it'd be further correction of the blood sugar? Or do you not, not observe that? Uh, sorry, I didn't quite get that. It well, was, well, I just wonder, you know, say, say somebody got their, you know, got the change in diet and everything, they got we're running blood sugars or say 130, 140, but they still are packing an extra 60 pounds of body fat. Well, Don't you think it's fair to offer them the carrot, so to speak, that when you lose that 60 pounds of body fat, you'll likely make enough correction that you'll get those blood sugars even better? Yeah, I think that is likely. Uh, you know, who's got a thousand patients to be able to say it happens all the time? I mean, yeah. these are rarities, people that will do what patient X did. You know, but that's why we have to look at them. Yeah, uh, I think you're right that uh, that's the case. I mean, his we measured his insulin on day one. How much insulin did he have in his blood? The level was two with a yeah. blood sugar of 295. It should have been 300 or 400. It was two. He just had an exhausted pancreas. What we don't know is, can you recover pancreatic function once you've exhausted it? Yeah. Uh, interesting question some hints that yes, you can. And I think that may be possible. I would love to do a glucose tolerance test on patient X right now and see whether it's normal or not. I think it might not be entirely normal. If you gave him a load of sugar to drink and just measured his blood sugar for five hours afterwards, it might not be normal. Even though his sugar is 80 and his fasting blood is uh, A1C is 5.0, on no meds for 11 years, but I don't know. Anyhow, what we can say is that obesity is not the cause of, that is body fat is not the cause of diabetes. Okay, now Dr. Kender devised the rice diet to provide very little fat, very little protein and to help damage kidneys recover. So the rice diet should help not hurt kidney function. And we were surprised when all of a sudden our patient's blood level of creatinine, which is the major indicator of how well your kidneys are functioning. Kidneys remove creatinine from the blood when they're not working, the creatinine level goes up. And it began to rise, not just go up, but it went up at an astronomical rate. So here's his numbers. Here's the normal range for blood creatinine. He was in the normal range. And over a period of weeks, 
it went up like a rocket taking off at Cape Canaveral. Now, this is vastly higher than you'd expect from intrinsic disease. Diabetics can get kidney disease. The time course is usually like this. His is like this. He had no protein in his urine, which is unusual by far for people with diabetes. Hypertension can cause kidney disease, but his blood pressure was down. So the question was, what was going on here? We couldn't understand. We asked the kidney specialist to look at him. They did. They said, we can't figure it out. It doesn't look like kidney disease. It doesn't look like, uh, I mean, excuse me, hypertensive disease. It doesn't look like diabetic disease. And the patient, again, the lesson that he taught was he found a report that on extremely rare occasions, patients taking the drug he was on, exenatide, which we had not been smart enough to stop on day one, can be associated with rapid rise in blood creatinine and kidney failure. So given his clue, we did the right thing then. We stopped exenatide. And what happened? This is what happened to his creatinine. It's come down and stayed at a very low and constant level since. It is not in the normal range. This essentially, this white area is essentially kidney reserve. As long as you're in this reserve area, you will not have symptoms, you will not have trouble. But if you're drifting up out of it into the red zone, you are in trouble. And if you get about five, you're gonna be on dialysis. So he stayed down, he's got some permanent loss of kidney function, but fortunately it is not drifting up. It is in fact, slowly drifting down over the years. So if he keeps this up, he's gonna live his days out with no evidence of kidney disease. So that brings this end of the story here. And I just want to review with you what happened with patient X. He came in 2011 with a BMI of 66. Six months later, he had a BMI of 32. And two years later, he had a BMI of 28. And last week he sent me this photograph and now he's got a BMI of 29, but he looks like this. And his statistics show that his weight has gone from 435 to 194. He hasn't shrunk yet. His BMI gone from 66 to 29. His blood pressure, 196. The most recent is 132. Diastolic from 120 to 74. His blood sugar has gone from 295 to 80. His A1C from 10.7 to 5.0. All these medicines have gone. He's taking a half dose of amlodipine which I consider a great success. And that's why I have not been more forceful about getting your BMI lower. Is he skating on the thin edge of things? Well, maybe, but he keeps skating. And I think that's important because I think the exercise tends to keep these in check. So what we're going to say in conclusion and what lessons should we learn from our patient stories? Well, I think of several. One, Dr. Kemner's salt restricted diet really does lower blood pressure. Two, the rice diet can it lead to long-term weight loss, but you have to pay constant attention. Calories do count. Measuring portion size is a key to weight loss. And people will say it's not the calories, it's the fat, it's the carbohydrates, it's the protein, it's the white food, I don't know, uh, you know, depending on your birth year or your gemstone or whatever. No, I think it's calories and I have no question about it. So if you want to eat, uh, a high calorie diet, it may be that a high calorie diet that's got more fat than carbohydrate is slightly less bad than what, I don't know, but they're all bad. The best bet is get the calories right. Calorie toxicity, calorie toxicity, in my word for what's going on. You've got too many calories, you put it away in all the good fat cells you've got, you put it away in bad fat places, and you've ended up stuffing your cells themselves with fatty acid intermediates. And this is what causes type two diabetes. If you start getting rid of them on day one, it starts going away on day one. A calorie restricted, yes, but high carb diet effectively controls type two diabetes. And we see this over and over again. Is it better than a calorie restricted high fat diet? No data, not worse though. And the lesson that patient taught us, beware, all drugs have side effects, even when they're unlisted on the label, because we read it and there's nothing on it, even now that I can read that says it's a rare event that he had 
But I think he got better when he stopped Exenatide. Doctoring is a partnership, always. So I think doctors need to pay attention to what their patient's saying. <laughs> In this case, he surely showed it to us. And then finally, here's the quote, sometimes ascribed to Thomas Jefferson, but apparently it's by Wendell Phillips, which says, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. You have to always constantly take care of yourself, but don't go it alone, particularly if you want to try the rice diet when it's, uh, you should have a medical advisor by your side that's comfortable about it, willing to see you frequently, willing to measure blood levels and take your word for what's happening. So that's what I have to say. That's the end of my right. presentation. Any other comments or questions? Or well, I was just going to say it's, it's amazing how you're 3,000 miles from where I am. And we do things the same way. <laughs> you know, coast to coast is, is all I can, you know. Yeah, all we have to do is worry now about all the entire middle of the country. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah, a few million doctors. Uh, but I'm, that's yeah, a financial yeah. problem. They're not getting paid to do uh, well. Right it, yeah, and it is hard. I mean, Dr. Kemner, you know, never could get this to just work by telling people to eat rice and fruit and measure your portions and do it. You know, there's something that happens when people come and spend time in residence. And I think it does make it, even then, it's far from perfect. I mean. Well, it's, it's you know, it's, it, you need that kind of support. You need the camaraderie with the other people there. This is why uh, right now we run a 12-day internet-based program yeah. that's heavily involved in patient interaction and staff and yeah. patient interaction. The, the other reason that I think it's important that um, people who are serious about not being ill anymore, uh, that they just do it right and they get involved in a program. We'll talk about whether the rice program is running now or not, but because things happen so fast, you know, just like with the diabetic medication, I need to, nobody's gonna tell you, except for Dr. Lim and myself, to get off these drugs like right now, yeah. because if you don't, yeah. You're, you're going to have a blood pressure that's too yeah. low to stand up. Well, we used you to see that patient, yeah, patients would come to us with, with rather severe heart failure, yeah. taking potent diuretic drugs. And they were told, never, ever stop this drug because you'll die if you do. And we'd say, well, you have to stop it on day one. We know that. We don't want to give drugs that force your kidneys to put sodium out if we're not going to be putting any sodium in. You will get in trouble with diuretic drugs in the rice diet. And they would do that with the greatest reluctance. We said, we'll see you first thing in the morning. We're here. And to their amazement, the, the, their weight would go down, their symptoms would get better, their blood pressure would resolve, and so it went away. Yeah. And they, and they woke up. They were, they were alive they the next day without this pile of drugs. That's I know it's hard, I, but I can understand why it's, uh, it's difficult for the we were never trained to do this. We were only trained to put people on medication, never take them off. Yeah. We were trained to, you know, one set of side effects versus another. And we also were willing to accept drugs that lower signs like cholesterol and blood pressure without prolonging patients' lives or the quality of their life. Just like the statin drugs are coming under such scrutiny these days because the recent evaluations of taking stat, stat drugs you know, like Lipitor and Provacol and Crestor, yeah. is that, yeah, they change the numbers drastically. But when you look out a few months or a few years, you don't live a day longer. And, and <laughs> you know, they, they, we're good at changing signs and, and maybe helping some symptoms along the way. But as far as curing people... Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's similar to people who want to cure diabetes and people who have type 2 diabetes and were obese by doing liposuction or lipectomy, removing fat cells. That doesn't make them any better either. In fact, if you get rid of all your fat cells, if you have this condition called lipodystrophy where you don't make fat cells, you're not protected from diabetes. You have terrible, severe type two diabetes, terrible type two diabetes with no fat cells because you have no safe place to put those extra calories. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the calories you're taking in that does the job. Uh, well, that, that's an interesting, I, I, I haven't heard that one before. I'm, oh, yes. Uh, you I'm look up the data on type on, on lipodystrophy. I mean, yeah. they, have no, they don't make leptin, this hormone that tells you you've had enough to eat. So they're always hungry, but they have no fat cells. They look well muscled because you can see all the muscles online. Well, I, I've got to I've got to spend some time looking at that's a, a new way to convince people that brown rice ain't so bad. Or even white <laughs> rice. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Well, how about, uh, you know, that I've, that I've got you here and I'd like to open it up for questions if you have questions. Yeah. 
okay. from, for Dr. Nealon about his, his experience. I mean, this, this is a, a, a treasure trove of information. He's taken care of who I consider the greatest mentor in my life. And uh, that man's not around anymore, but uh, his, his uh, apostle, so to speak, is. And Frank Nealon worked with him for, you know, for 16 yeah. years. Yeah. And uh, he knows a lot. So if you have any questions about Dr. Kempner, but just kind of throw things out. Are there any patients that really stick in your mind that you didn't think that they would possibly ever get better? And I guess I'm, I'm throwing in the possibility of uh, people with lymphomas, cancers, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, things that we were always told, always told in medical school that diet has nothing to do with these problems. Of course, <clears throat> we're finding out these days it has a lot to do with them. But in your, in your many years of taking care of, you know, several thousand people of have you ever stood back and said, you know, you weren't supposed to get better and you did? Well, you know, the, I think the most surprising thing for us was that patients with psoriasis that went on the rice diet often had a marked improvement in their psoriasis eruption. In fact, Dr. Barbara Kemp, Barbara Newborg, who was the last doctor who really was under Dr. Kempner's wing and then worked at the rice diet program and has written an interesting book about Dr. Kempner. I gave the title to that on my first slide. Dr. Newborg wrote a paper about this, the clearing of psoriasis when people eat rice diet. You know, psoriasis looks like it's an allergic response, but no one knows what you're allergic to. And it may well be that it is something we're ingesting. And if you eat this rather simple diet, rice and fruit, it gets better. Well, you know, it's been explained to me, and I think I got this from Nathan Pritikin, that it's a circulatory problem in the skin. And as a consequence uh, of the circulation, that's poor circulation caused by an unhealthy diet. And some people, they break out with the psoriatic arthritis, the same explanation, it being a circulatory problem has been given for inflammatory arthritis. Yeah. Which of course, psoriatic is, uh, is in a group of not only arthritis, but skin conditions. So maybe it has to do with the circulation. Well, now, one, well, of, the, one of them, Go ahead. Yeah, you know, you know uh, the, the patients that came to see us in general did not have these. Uh, we, we, we were, you know, relying on patients that came to us. So we took who came and not, we didn't go out seeking people with difficult conditions. And so I can't speak to most of them. But I was surprised that many patients would remark how much more energy they had after they lost the little weight. And I think it may well be because more people than we recognize have this obstructed breathing condition called sleep apnea. It's not diagnosed. There's no good way to diagnose it unless you actually study people while they sleep. And I think with this was undiagnosed sleep apnea that got better. Uh, and I remember one lady that came to us, she lost the most weight rapidly that I have ever seen on the diet. She lost weight at the rate of about three pounds a day for about six weeks. And we had no explanation of that. Most people lose weight rapidly on when they start the rice diet from five to 10 days. And then it slows down and it's a slow, steady decline thereafter. But her rapid phase lasted six weeks. And so we just didn't understand what that was about and why it was, but we're glad she was better. Her son flew in to visit her at the airport. And when he met her, he gave her a hug and he said, oh, mom, you're soft. And she thought, well, you know, he's recognizing my inner soul. He said, no, I mean, when I feel you, you're soft. And I think he was right. My guess is this lady had unsuspected pulmonary hypertension with severe left-sided fluid collection in the body. And when she got on the rice diet and began to do it. In fact, she did get softer. The skin was no longer tensely dilated. Again, there's no easy way to look at pulmonary hypertension. So we didn't go out to seek patients with that condition, but I think it would be interesting to look at what happens to them. Well, when I, when I visited you in uh, Durham, North Carolina, one of the questions I asked you was whether or not you saw people with inflammatory arthritis like yeah. rheumatoid arthritis get better. And your response was yes, and Dr. Kempner thinks it's because of the sodium. Of course, yeah. you know, that's, that was Dr. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Kempner had these theories related to sodium and the oxygen consumption of cells. Remember, he was working with Otto Warburg originally. And Warburg invented a method which he could study the uptake of oxygen by cells, not by tissues as such, but by individual cells. 
And uh, Kempner believed that the amount of sodium changed the oxygen level. I don't know of any real data to support that. That was his yeah. theory. Well, my response to you was, who cares? You know, <laughs> the diets we recommend, whether it's the fat or the improvement of circulation or it's the yeah. lower sodium, uh, the important thing to understand is that the cure rate is just phenomenal with these things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any, any, any other uh, fond memories you'd like to share with us uh, about Dr. Kempner? I, I don't want to get into, you know, just like any genius, any hero of our time, there have been his naysayers out there, and I certainly oh, don't sure. have that type of. Yeah, well, I think people could, you know, take, you know, he was no, you know, you know, paragon of perfection. He was a human being, as we all know, uh, and he could be very harsh to his patients. I mean, if they didn't adhere to the diet, he would say, you're done, you're out of here, I never want to see you again, please don't come back, and he would not take them back. I mean, he said, no, it was no. Uh, he had this quirk of being driven around Durham in a open top Lincoln convertible. <laughs> and he enjoyed that. He was, you know, chauffeur. Uh, but, you know, the thing about Kempner was his steadfast dedication to this notion of I can help people get better. And he did help people get better. Uh, as I told you, we're analyzing the data on his patients with malignant hypertension. We've got a cohort of almost 600 patients with bona fide malignant hypertension. That's one of the biggest series ever collected. Uh, and we're gonna analyze that and present some of the data at the upcoming meeting on Friday in the American Heart Association hypertension meetings oh, in good. San Diego. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. That's, that, that'll be, you think it'll hit the newspapers or you'll well, certainly you let me know tell. about people, it. People may want it to, you know, it's gonna be interesting to, at least from a historical note, these terrible mm -hmm. records I'm now 80 years old and teaching us new things already. Yeah, that's a, that's a, it's a collection that it's unlikely that anybody else will, get, will put together. Oh, no one's going to get that. <laughs> Malignant hypertension has disappeared from view. Nobody really knows why. But we rarely see malignant hypertension now. And he had 700 patients. It's not because of the <clears throat> invention of diuretics. Uh, you know, they, they, drugs do lower blood pressure. And so if someone comes in with very severe hypertension, you recognize that you treat them, you'll get it down and you probably will prevent it. But half the people don't even know they have hypertension. So we might have seen a decline to 50%, but it's virtually disappeared. It's very unusual. Plenty of it in Africa. There's a lot of malignant hypertension in Africa, but not in the United States. If, if anybody would, would, would want to get uh, uh, the rice dry diet therapy as, as pure as it could be getting, yeah. had these days, uh, yeah. is there any place to go? Uh, John, I think you are the closest thing to Walt McKemner that now is living and breathing because the rice diet, as we know, it closed in 2016. And so it, there's no longer any place in Durham to come. Uh, there are some books you can read. Uh, Kitty Rosati, who was Bob Rosati's wife, has written a couple of books which give dietary, but the diet is simple. Diet is rice and fruits and grains and vegetables. I mean, you know, <laughs> and it's, very it's little sodium. Bad. And what you need to have is a doctor that can hold your hand while you do it, recognizing that untoward effects are very rare, but being ready to hop on them when they occur. And it's very hard to find doctors. They're not set up to do that. They don't know about it. Their practices aren't organized to see people for, you know, five minutes every day. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just hard. It's kind of, it's kind of like it with, a, with a, a, a good plant. You just water it, put it in the sunshine and step <laughs> back and it grows. <laughs> but, you know, that's what we do with patients. Just give them well, a little good soil, you know, a little sunshine. Uh, you may have read uh, Victoria Sweet's book, God's Hotel. Have you ever seen? Read I, I know Victoria Sweet. Oh, it's 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 a very interesting book, and she comes up with this ancient principle called veriditas, which she ascribes to this medieval nun named Hildegard of Bingen. And Hildegard said, "The way you take care of patients," she was a, a nurse as well. The way you take care of patients is you, you the way you take care of plants. You feed them, and you give them light and space to grow, and they do grow. And so with time and attention and care about these things, people do get well. So it is veriditas, the Latin word for greening. Uh, can you give us just, just the, the short history on the demise of the rice diet? It was, you know, it was seven decades that uh, yeah. Kempner was at Duke. Well, as, as I Dr. recall, 
yeah. as I recall, Duke Duke the, received the majority of its financial support no, from the Reich diet for two they, decades. They, they 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 got a lot of it from Kepler. He was so. Why why, why you know when we come to the the day and age of enlightenment, you know of, of honesty of uh, you know trying to really care for patients, what why why did Duke University decide? That there wasn't room for the the rice diet anymore. I mean, can you tell me in as yeah. Yeah. as nice a way as possible? Money. Yeah, money. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, we talked about how I got interested in the rice diet. You know, when I came to medical school, I really learned subtly and not overtly there were two ways to take care of patient problems. You could operate on them, and that was a chance to cure them overnight. Or you could give them the drugs and that was a chance to help them stay better and stay healthier longer, although you rarely ever cured them. I chose the medicine career and I saw patients that we treated and made them a little bit better and we rarely cured them. And when I went to the rice diet, I saw something in medicine that was as close to surgery as I could ever see. And literally the, the blind saw and the lame walked, literally. Patients that couldn't see their vision got better Patients who couldn't walk ended up being able to walk now. Uh, patient, one patient came to get his hip transplant, but he was in such bad physical shape. His doctor brother said, you can't afford to go through surgery. Go down to the rice diet and do what they say and then come back and we'll do your hip surgery. So he came down, spent nine months here, got so much better than when he went back home, he didn't need her hip surgery. And that's happened lots. But, you know, Dr. Kempner ran out of hypertensive patients when the drug company said, you can take these pills and you don't have to change your life. And people thought, well, that's easier. I like the way I'm living and I will keep doing it. So that's what they did. So hypertensive patients diminished. He then took care of obesity as such, although he treated it always as a health condition, not a cosmetic one. But patients came for that they would lose weight and then they would get better. They would come back. And then bariatric surgery came and said, we can take care of that by rearranging your internal anatomy. We can make weight loss much more easy to do and much more difficult to get around, which they have done. It's difficult to gain weight back if you had surgery, but not impossible. And we saw many patients that would come back having regained every ounce they lost after barrack surgery, only left with the complications. They avoided the big one, death on the operating table, but they had still malabsorption of iron, malabsorption of calcium, malabsorption of vitamin D, uh, dumping they were, they were still hungry. Oh, well, <laughs> they can't eat. It, it, they, it hurts to eat. Yeah. So, but anyhow, that, that took a, a whole other cohort of people out so that the numbers of patients coming diminished. And so, uh, so and, it's, and, it's just and, and, a, a matter of patient population that yeah. that uh, Duke decided that there would be a more productive use of the space. Yeah, I think they could have taken the other tack, which said, you know, this right diet really could work. We just need to get people who are much smarter about how to do the kind of scientific investigation that will tell, tell people there's a real basis for this and that we need to get people who really knew how to market our products so that we had something to offer to more people. And we didn't get that. We said, listen, it's too much of a risk. We're going to get, get rid of it. So they jettisoned the rice diet. Yeah. Well, that's, of course, is a shame. But <clears throat> all of his uh, work has not been lost. No. Th and thanks to you. Can this record still live? They still do. Thanks, thanks to you, uh, Dr. Frank Nealon. Yeah. Uh, I was able to get a copy of volume one and volume two of uh, Walter Kempner's work. And I was also able to get it copied so that it is in a PDF format. So it's available to anybody who wants. Uh, if you read German, you can read volume one. If you <laughs> read English, you can read volume two. But there are a thousand patients that describe this man's work. Yeah. And again, you know, I appreciate it so much that you made those yeah. available to me. And sure, I, sure. Uh, I took the trouble to, uh, to make it available to the public. I was the one that did that. Good. But <laughs> otherwise... Without what's going to happen? You, you're 88 years old, and I'm yeah. 75. Uh, where, 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 where are the soldiers? Where's the army that's going to take over this uh, sanity, this sane way of taking care of people, which is to fix the problem, to cure them? Are they going to rise up? I just don't know. Yeah, well, you, you've been around a lot longer than I have. You tell me. Uh, 
Well, you know, it's this notion of the epiphany that you get when you see it happen. And if you don't have a place where you can see it happen, no one is going to have an epiphany. I went to the rice diet and saw it. I said, my gosh, these people are getting yeah. well. And, and uh, you know, I was, I'd been giving lots of insulin and lots of thyroid hormone and pituitary extract and antidiuretic hormone injections and made people better. But the people at the rice house, they had different conditions, but they got well. Yeah. And that was the miraculous thing. You no longer had to manage them. You were, as Dr. Lim says, at the end of each one of our programs, he's got, you know, somewhere around 50 people to talk about. He says, you know, they taught me, they taught me to manage patients in medical school. Boy, I'm sure, sure glad I don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. It, it is, again, it's, from yours and my point of view and a lot of our, our viewers out there, it, they sit back and they say, this is almost too hard to believe that yeah. such solid science would be would be uh, relegated to the, not just the back room, but the very back closet in the back room. You know, they have uh, have actively uh, worked against it. You know, they used to say things like diet and diabenes. Yeah. They put, remember that when they had diet first and then diabenes, they don't even bother anymore. They just go, they just go to the drug. Thinking nobody will notice. A few years ago, someone had a brochure. It may have been the American Diabetes Association. And it was called Living Better with Diabetes. Yeah. And I kept thinking, wouldn't it be good to have a book that said Living Better Without Diabetes? Because yeah. I think we could do that. But it takes a kind of, you know, I, I showed you the case of patient X who shows this to an extremely remarkable degree. But how to get all the rest of the people that are come or interested to do what patient X did, that is dedicate himself to a future life or measuring what he eats. When he goes on vacation with his college buddies, he's done that for years. They go for a week to someplace like Martha's Vineyard, you know, to spend a week together and they drink beer and eat pizza and play poker and swim in the ocean. He takes his rice cooker and his fruit with him and they say, X, why on earth, you know, one week, how could that hurt you? He said, you know, I just don't think I want to do that. So he watches them eat pizza and he eats rice and fruit. But he's alive. He, oh, he's not alive. He's a different man. I yeah, mean, he, you, know, he, you saw the pictures. Yeah. He looks like it's the re- reverse sequence of the aging. Well, it, right, it, it, there's just so much at stake and people don't realize that the tragedy is right around the corner. It's the breast lump that's right around the corner. It's the chest pain that's right around the corner. It's the, the diabetic blood test is right around the corner. And we're talking about, you know, a good share of the population of the United States being ill. 80% are overweight or obese. And, oh, yeah. you know, they, they plain and simple don't, uh, don't stand a chance. But, you know, I, I, I realize what you say. And, and I've uh, spent my entire career with this understanding. The first book that Mary, my wife, and I wrote together was called Making the Change, because we knew it was the change that it was all about. How do you get people to change? And we have you know, done various things, including running a hospital-based program, which I did for 16 years, a resort-based program, which I did for 18 years. And now for the last uh, four years, we've been running a telemedicine program. And I'll tell you, uh, maybe I can get you involved in this. We're always <laughs> needing new doctors. I have, that's a great idea. Uh, what we do is we take care of people all over the world. And uh, we've focused, our intensity has been to get people to experience the program. And so we start out with an examination by our doctor. We have support specialists that spend uh, you know, every day with them. And, and they also get some time together. I, you know, this is something we didn't think we could really duplicate when we left the resort is how to get people to interact with each other so they can sit down at a table and they can tell stories without the staff listening. And so we run, a, we run an hour and a half session every morning where people get together and they share with each other. I got, you know, I got off like four diabetic pills. Oh, well, I got off the three blood pressure pills and I, you know, had the first bowel movement I've had in years without yeah. help. You know, they, they just, they interact with each other and it's been probably the most valuable yeah. part of the program. And the nice thing is we continue this on like forever. Yeah. We have the support staff that sees them every week for a while. And then we have 
support staff see him for every month and then they see each other every, you know once a week often for a lot they make friends for a lifetime it is the support it's the experience and well you know, I, you know i think i think the greatest failure of modern medical science in, in writ large has been the failure to find a way to get people to actually do what they say and think they want to do because most of the patients that come say, yes, I want to lose weight or yes, I want to be healthier. And, you know, then you have to say, okay, that translates into what are you going to do from now on and how to get them to commit to that. I, I remember that the, the famous American writer Flannery O'Connor was once asked at a meeting if she met a lot of young women these days who wanted to be famous writers. And she said, you know, I do meet a lot of women that want to be famous writers but I don't meet very many at all that want to become famous writers. And it's that dedication to the becoming that makes the difference. It goes on forever. Uh, I remember there's a, there's a, a, a poem by the, the German, or I guess Austrian, who was born in Prague, but in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Rilke wrote a poem about this archaic torso of Apollo, which he looks at and describes. And at the end, he says, there is nothing that is not looking at you. You must change your life. And I think that's what we have got. Diet, after all, is it comes from the Greek. And in Greek, it means way of life. So people say, I want to go on a diet. And say, what diet are you on? I say, I'm not on a diet. Well, if you're living, you are on a diet. Uh, yeah. Chef, Chef AJ, do we have we have you there? <laughs> She's having a peanut. Of her. No, no, I, I I wanted to take myself off so that I didn't trigger any uh, sound. But yes, you have, any, you have any questions for uh, Dr. Yes, Mina? absolutely. Can we, we just run a few by this man? He's he's <laughs> oh, he's it made a wonderful hour for me, filling a lot of gaps. Well, it's an hour and a half. We better not. No, oh, well, well I, I, Dr. Neelan, I probably should have warned you that Dr. McDougall has known to go up to four hours sometimes. Oh, come on. We're not, not going to do that today. No, of course not. But yes, there are questions. Thank you. And guys, now is the time to type your questions, but some were sent in in advance. And so there was a rumor that Dr. Kempner beat his patients. Is that true? Yes, that is true. Uh, but the patient that brought that charge, one patient uh, to which he admitted, came to her and said, Dr. Kenner, I've been a bad girl and I need to be spanked. And he, Dr. Kemner, who grew up in, in Prussia after all, and I think was dedicated to the notion uh, that the uh, sparing the rod spoils the child, he agreed to her uh, request and he did spank her with a riding crop that she gave to him for the purpose. Uh, that was, you know, this was after her time on the rice diet when she was living in Durham and involved with Dr. Kemner in the rice diet program. But as far as the patients that were there, that was not part of the therapeutic modality at all. Okay, so I guess it's not possible to, to spank someone skinny. Well, that's right. Well, I don't know. And, you know, whether it was wise or sensible, no, it never went to court. Dr. Kemner died and it was settled out of court after his death. Uh, but he admitted to the fact that he had spanked her. So wow. there's no getting around that fact. And the question is, well, why? And his rationale was that she needed it and said she wanted it, and I wanted to help her. Wow. That that, that would be a big deal today, uh, let me no, tell you. Well, it is a big deal today. And I think people are looking at it with the lenses of today about something that happened, you know, 50 years ago when things were different in that time. But I don't think you should take away at all from the work or what happens with the diet. And that's a mistake to say, well, if he had a transgression and, you know, a lapse, then, you know, we have to, you know, no. 100% agree, 100% agree. So a lot of people are asking if you happen to know what diet did Dr. Kempner personally follow? Dr. Kempner carefully followed his calories to the end, but did he eat just rice and fruit? No. And he used to say, that this diet is very bland and very monotonous, which it is. So if you're eating for excitement, the rice diet is not the one to do it. Find excitement somewhere else in your life, not in what you eat. Uh, but what he did was he weighed himself every single day. And if his weight went up one pound, he fasted until it was back down. 
So he was very careful, very abstemious, but he did not eat just rice and fruit. I, I heard him say, you know, secondhand, of course, that uh, he would say to the patients, when you get as healthy as I am, then you can eat like me. Yeah. Well, Kemner, Kemner was a pragmatist. You know, and people would say they're on the rice diet doing very well. I'd say, Dr. Kemner, can I have lobster now? <laughs> and they'd say, well, the way to find out is to have a lobster and let's see what happens to your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your weight. And if they could eat it and nothing happened, he'd let them keep eating. <laughs> really? Did did he ever try the rice diet himself, even for a brief period, just to experience what it you was know, like? I don't know that. I have. I went on rice and food for 28 straight days to see what it was like. And how was that for you? Just fine, actually. I, I lost about 30 pounds. My blood pressure improved dramatically, and I've been healthier ever since. Do, do you ever go back to it or, or do you, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, I mean, look, you're 86, you look amazing. You don't <laughs> seem to have any kind of cognitive decline. And so uh, uh, do you follow a fairly healthy diet and exercise program even till today? Well, I do, uh, you know, if, but I don't eat just rice and fruit anymore. I mean, that is, it's not hard, but the, the social uh, events get really difficult. As I say, my friend, patient X takes his rice cooker on his yearly retreat with his college buddies. But most people aren't willing to go quite that far. Right. Uh, there, there, there's a whole a whole bunch of issues here. Um, you know, one is, is if you don't make the diet strict enough that people get results, they're not going to follow it. And if you make it strict enough to give them results, uh, you know, sometimes they don't don't want to follow it. Um, you know, I, I would I would guess. Dr. Kempers, your experience has been kind of like mine, and that is once you lay out the plan for people <clears throat> and they accept it and they get on it and they see the phenomenal benefits and they find out, you know, that it's really not so hard and not so restrictive that they, um, they do much better if they stick with it hundred percent. You know, somehow or another, that moderation seems to be a slippery slope. <laughs> well, it's because people kid themselves about their portion sizes. <laughs> Well, they also think they can, they can get away with it. You know, it's just like a drug addict. You know, they, you know, I, well, I can have one cigarette, not true. Or one drink <laughs> of alcohol, not true. And I, so I think it's the same way with the food thing is, but, but you know, and I wanna look at well, another thing from, from a perspective is <clears throat> what the usual plant food, whole food doctor recommends uh, is not strict compared to myself and what I recommend, which is a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. But compared to the Kempner diet, I, I seem like a luxurious dinner table. Well, that's true. And, and you know, as they say, doing comparisons about whether one works and one doesn't work, I think the really stickling point is how to get people to say, I am going to change my life and do it. And, uh, you know, Kemner got some patients to do it. We occasionally did. I thought that was our sh greatest shortcoming was how to help people really get over that, you know, their permanent thing. Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. If you want to be free of disease and ill health and all these other complaints, eternal vigilance. And most people think eternity is a long time. Well, they, they, they spent 40, 50, 60 years getting themselves into trouble. They ought to have a little day, a few days for penance. Well, and they're in trouble because, you know, the food that people get offered is not because it's untasty or unhealthy or, or unpalatable. I mean, people go out of their way to make it seductively tasty. That's one of the best quotes I've ever heard. Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Is that, can I credit you with that? Because I'm going to use it. No, that. no, no. I would wish I could have said it. It is actually quoted to a man named Wendell Phillips, who was an abolitionist preacher in, uh, in Boston. Although he may have stolen it from another Irishman named Cogan, who apparently wrote something almost, if not identically similar, in the late 1700s. You can look it up online. No, I, most people ascribe it to. Thomas Jefferson, and I thought it was too. Then when I wanted to look it up, I got led to Wendell Phillips. That, that is so true. There's a bunch of questions for both of you, but uh, Dr. Okay. Uh, Neelan, you're talking about, about you know, 
people overestimating their or underestimating their portion sizes. Do you think that everyone has to weigh and measure their food? Because I follow Dr. McDougall's eating style and I eat what he calls ad libitum, but I'm eating the right foods. And I've never, and I used to be obese myself, almost 200 pounds, but I find if I'm eating the right food, like Dr. McDougall recommends, no, no oil, whole food, plant-based, low in fat that I, I never have to, and I, I eat very, very large portions. So I'm wondering if, if this is just for people that were obese and diabetic, or you think everybody needs to do this? No, I don't, I don't mean to say that everybody that needs to do it. I, I'm as pragmatic as Dr. Kempner. If what you're doing is working, the, the famous quotation from a man named Robert Rurr, who was the professor of medicine at Columbia in the early 1920s. Uh, he said to his new interns, if what you're doing is working, don't stop. If what you're doing is not working, stop. And the third quote apparently was, for God's sakes, keep the patients out of the hands of the surgeons. Yeah. Now, that's good advice too, but if what you're doing is working, who's to argue with it? Okay, but the proof of that will be the scales, your blood tests, your symptoms, your blood pressure. Okay, I mean, if they're all fine, it's like my patient that we just talked about, patient X has a BMI of 29. If you say to me, is that good? Should he be there? I would say, and I have said to him, I think you should be lower. But he's gone 11 years at that level and everything looks good. Well, you know, so sometimes it's that last 20 pounds. It is. And, yeah. you know, it would take, you know, reprogramming and re-digital diligence to get back. I, I think he could. Uh, he would have more reserve. He'd have more money in the bank in case something does go amiss. But, you know. Dr. Nealon, I once heard you say, because I, I, there wasn't a lot about you that I could watch or listen to. And people are saying they would love for you to throw your hat back in the ring and 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 start <laughs> practicing again, even if it's just virtual consults. People <laughs> really like you. But yeah. I heard you say... All animals left to their own devices will overeat. And do you think that's true, even animals in nature? And I'm not talking about zoos, but like I, I, you know, I live somewhere where I see jackrabbits and coyotes and foxes, and I don't see any overweight animals in nature. Right. Well, of course, we don't know what they're overweight, really, do we? I mean, until we <laughs> measure what everything's going on. We look at them, they look normal to us. Uh, several years ago, I happened to see a short video clip of young students, grade school students, they were waiting to get the first of the sock vaccine for polio. And they were cavorting in the playground and jumping around. I said, my God, they're all skinny. And you know what? They were all skinny and they were all normal weight. And so now if you see kids in the playground, they're gonna be much heavier and we think that's normal. So I don't know what's normal for an animal in the, in the wilderness. Uh, it's like sodium. My friend Phil Clummer says to me, man was designed to desire salt and seek salt and never to find salt. And it's the same way with calories. We were designed because in the wild, there probably has to be that way to seek food, make sure you've got enough, to make sure you've got enough gas in the tank for the trip across the Mojave Desert. You know, you don't know what's coming up. You want to make sure you've got enough. And if it's always hard to get enough, if it's there, you take it. So all the all the systems are designed to make sure you've got enough. And no systems are designed to say, wait, that's too much and stop. And that's essentially, I think, how the body works. And so we're fighting that battle now. We have gone from the land of want to the land of plenty. And so it's hard. You have to live in that when the natural systems don't go. In, in the zoos where we do look at the animals, one of the real problems with zookeepers is keep their animals healthy and not get overweight. They do tend to get overweight. Yeah, that's it. Abigail, who's watching live, wants to know if you personally are a big white rice eater. I, I do eat white rice. Uh, I know I, I don't eat it exclusively by any means. I like brown rice and I had that. Kemner wanted white rice because he was treating people with malignant hypertension. I say, get rid of sodium by getting rid of the, the husk of the, of the rice and make it white rice. As Dr. McDougall alluded, Dr. Cameron actually boiled the rice and then washed it twice more with distilled water to get rid of the last milligram of sodium that he could. So I don't think there's, you know, people nowadays worry about white rice and, and uh, arsenic. 
And well, we didn't know about arsenic and rice, so he didn't worry about it. He probably still wouldn't worry about it. Uh, and, and in all honesty, it, it may be that you should be careful about the kind of white rice you buy because some have got more arsenic than others, but I don't know. And a, a lot of the viewers are asking, do you ever anticipate it coming, you know, a lot of, they say everything old is new again, will it ever come back where that people could actually go to doctors who will administer the rice dye to them? Because one of the viewers is asking, is there a doctor near me where I can actually go on this rice diet and be monitored? Uh, a couple of people that tried rice diet like programs, and I think they've closed up too. It's, it's hard to do it by telling people, eat this and go home. Uh, you know, it helps to be there. Patient X, whose case I gave you in detail, had a stay at the rice diet in 1986, very successfully lost weight. His borderline blood pressure and sugar normalized. Did that save him from coming back? Yeah, unfortunately it didn't. Fortunately for us, because we got a chance to see what could happen. Uh, but I think he hadn't made that commitment to saying, I must change my life which he did do. Yeah. Well, you know, I would also say that <clears throat> any, any kind of program out there has to have a really strong, dedicated leader. And Dr. Kempton was that, and Nathan Pritikin was that, and I try and be that for my patients because this is not easy to do. I mean, it's a, it, it takes a lot of effort to just make a living, you know, to feel good at the end of the day, except for the patients. <laughs> you know, the, the patients are just a, a tremendous reward. So I, I think the reason that uh, the Kempner program is not able to be replaced is even though you are very dedicated and were you know, one of the most important uh, apostles of Walter Kempner, he had a fire in him, didn't he? Oh, he did. Yeah. And no, no question. He was convinced this was going to save people. And it did. I mean, the, the data on the malignant hypertension is going to be just mind boggling when we finally get them fully analyzed. And you say this Friday they're going to present it? They're going to have the first the first little snippet out of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope it, I hope it uh, you know at least uh, at least uh, appears on the curiosity page of some <laughs> newspaper. <laughs> well, I wouldn't be surprised because it's going to have this you know this notion about Kempner. Yeah. Well. Yeah. You know, I I tell uh, every once in a while it comes up with uh, Chef AJ that some somebody would like to. Uh, argue with me and, you know, explain to me that I really don't know what I'm talking about. And, and I say, I'd be glad to have a discussion with you, but first you need to read Walter Kempner's work. And I also <laughs> tell them they need to read, read Nathan Pritikin's work. And I said, once you read that and understand it, we can, we can talk all day long because, you know, otherwise I, I'm, I'm fighting with somebody that has no idea what's going on. If you don't know the basics, you need to know the basics. Kempner taught the basic, so did Nathan Pritikin sort of a few other people out there, but uh, you know the, the newcomers, uh, so to speak, are they got a couple of research papers under their belt, and they think they're going to change the world. <laughs> wait till wait till you have wait till you have twelve thousand people under your belt, and then we can start talking yeah. about it. Actually, it was Kemner had sixteen thousand in the database. Well, I'm going to have to keep working another few years then. So I'm only up to twelve. <laughs> So Kathy, who's watching live, says, speaking from experience, a lot of people who are obese are also nutrient deficient. Do you need to supplement at all while on the rice diet? And if so, with what? The, the only supplement that Dr. Kempney gave was a multivitamin every day because he recognized that it was potential to become vitamin depleted on this restrict diet. Uh, people worried about the protein content. Kempner had patients with the so-called nephrotic syndrome, where they're wasting so much protein through their kidney that their blood levels are dangerously low and they begin to swell because they have too little protein in their blood. And they said, you put them on this low protein diet, they will, they will die. He said, well, come over to the rice house and let me show you how well they're doing. He said, we don't need to come. We already know they'd die. <laughs> so they didn't come and they didn't see the fact that in fact, when he put them on the diet, the protein wasting went away and their blood levels actually rose. So it's a low protein diet. Should people be on rice and fruit forever? I think not. Dr. Kemner didn't. He say, stay on that till you get well, and then we're gonna add vegetables. He did add small amounts of animal protein. He was not strictly vegetarian, but it was small amounts, believe me. 
I just want to read you a, a comment and a question from Bethany, who's been on the rice diet. She says it's changed her life from bedridden to walk to walking again. Losing 90 pounds was a side effect. Reverse stage two hypertension and much more. Uh, you and Kempner are my greatest heroes. And she said, you're never too young to get back in the ring. Any chance of you writing a book, Dr. Nealon, or even seeing patients virtually in your future? Uh, well, I, you know, you think that when you retire, you'll have nothing to do and you'll sit twiddling watching a thumb. But it turns out my days seem to be fuller since I've retired. I've got this whole Kempner revivification project that's ongoing. Uh, I intend to write up the data about the rice diet and its effects on, on hemoglobin A1C, which are really dramatic. Uh, we're going to look at obesity and how you should look at it. I think most people look at the way you should lose weight. We're looking at the, the statistics and the numbers of it wrong. So there's lots and lots of things to do. Uh, so I think it's unlikely that I'll get back into actual practice. And uh, books are okay. I don't know. I think something like this these days is probably more valuable than another book because the problem is not what to do. I used to tell patients that writers, everybody knows the right thing to do to get and stay healthy. We wrote it down 4,000 years ago. I mean, it is, you take the 10 commandments and follow them. You'll be healthier. I mean, everyone's known what to do. Even people that smoke cigarettes, you know, I came back in the heyday of cigarette smoking. They used to give out free cigarettes to patients on the wards of Duke Hospital when I came. Okay, samples from Lucky Strikes. They made them in Durham. Uh, and people would say, well, we call them coffin nails because, you know, they can't do anything, but it's not hurting me. And they just smoked them anyhow. They knew. So it's not knowledge. It's not a knowledge deficit. It's somehow this will to succeed, this... It's what Rilke said. When he looked at the world, he said, there is no place that's not looking back at you. You must change your life. That's what the world was saying to him. I mean, he got that the whole thing. Rilke, as a young man, was a struggling poet, and he got a chance to write a monograph on the, on the sculptor Rodin. So he went to Paris, and he spent time with Rodin and wrote his things, but he confessed to Rodin that he was having trouble getting his own work going, that he felt the creative urge going. And Rodin, instead of saying, well, you need to change what you're eating or drinking or thinking or going or you know who you're seeing or what you're doing, he said, go to the zoo. And Rodin said, well, what should I do with the zoo? Rodin said, look at an animal until you see it. Wow. You know, if and you don't that want was to, the advice. You should write a book just of your fabulous quotes. <laughs> but just think about that. Go to the zoo and look at an animal until you see it. And that's when his whole poetry began to, to and that archaic torso of Apollo came out of that afterwards. And so that when you go to the zoo and you look at this panther behind the iron bars, the panther's looking at you behind iron bars. The world is looking back at you. You must change your life. Wow. Do you believe in this concept of food addiction or that at least for some people, certain foods have an addictive like process? Uh, I think that is probably likely true, although, because you know, there's a good science supporting that. I, I, I know David Kessler wrote a book called The End of Overeating. I thought it was very well done. Uh, he reviewed a lot of the science that backs that up, and he, his own testimony was that he could never eat another French fry in his life. And Siegel said, why don't you like him? He said, because I love them. Yeah. I would love to have him on the show. I wrote him once, but he's, he's gotten so busy. A lot of people are asking if you saw other diseases improve with the rice diet, like, for instance, gout or cancer. Yeah. Uh, no, we never really took a chance on gout because there is an effective drug treatment for it. Uh, so no one's really studied it. The rice diet ought in theory to be beneficial for gout, but is it as good as allopurinol? I don't know. Uh, and so we did have patients with gout, but we recommended that they continue their medication. As I said, we would do not want to be therapeutic nihilists. I just say, get rid of every medicine you don't have to take. If there's a way to get you into that position, you should get there. 
Uh, but if you need it, you should take it. Uh, so I, the gout, I, I never had a chance to see it just go away. Thank you. Blake's saying, so you really can eat rice ad libitum and lose weight? Or did they measure the rice? Well, for they everybody? measured rice. Yeah. Well, you know, the rice diet for, for weight loss, the rice diet program was rice, fruits, grains, and vegetables, small amount of fish once a week. And we measured the portions every time. So if a morning it was one cup of rice and one cup of fruit, that's after cooking. For dinner, it was one cup of rice and two cups of fruit. For, for supper, it was one cup of rice and two cups of fruit or vegetables. If you had something like a potato, you could have one potato and call that a cup, you know, but yeah. Now I know you can go get these gigantic potatoes, you know, that someone raised them on a weight 18 pounds. We don't mean you should eat one of those at every meal, okay? But a standard potato, we counted that as a cup. So it was essentially eight cups of food a day. Three of them were rice and three of them were fruits, grains, non-starchy vegetables. Wow, that's not enough food for me. <laughs> well, and you know, if your weight is down, this is not to say people should eat that forever, but yeah. if your weight is down and you're healthy, then you should eat whatever it takes to keep you where you're at. Yeah. Wow. It's, it sounds, I, I, my brother was, was a physician, morbidly obese, and went to Duke while the rice diet was there. And it was really the only time he lost weight other than the Ornish program. So we know it works. Um, Linda's okay. saying, did you actually say, Dr. Neeland, that the rice diet resolved people with sleep apnea? Well, weight loss does. You know, and I think there's no question about that. So, I mean, and again, we did not know, they didn't know they had sleep apnea, we did not know it, but they would say, I'm waking up in the morning and I'm so much more refreshed. Well, why should that be? I think probably because their sleep apnea got better. Hmm. You know, people worry with this low protein diet, people would be just weak and trembling and, and able to walk and people were walking. I mean, the rice diet was eat rice and fruit and walk. And Dr. Cameron believed in walking. And so everyone was told to walk. And so people walk eight or 10 miles a day on on thousand calories and feel fine. It's amazing. Amazing. Uh, she says she's only five pounds overweight, but I have a very skinny husband and he has sleep apnea. Like, so you can. Well, also... it's not, not all sleep apnea is to do to uh, obesity. Not all of it's to do obstruction, you know, so you have to be careful about that. And, and uh, as I say, I don't have data on it. I just had was surprised by how many people said they, they, they felt so much more wide awake. Yeah. It must be very gratifying to have seen so many people get well. Well, I told you, that's why, you know, it's the only thing near surgery that I saw from medicine. You know, surgery, some because they get a bad gallbladder and they're in terrible straits, they might die tonight, you operate and tomorrow they're better. And where does that happen? Not in medicine, except on these dietary programs. And then it does. Didn't I hear you once say that you told, would tell patients that they should put their bathroom scale right in front of the refrigerator? <laughs> I said that uh, someone could eat as much as they want if they're willing to do that, and eat all the meals standing on the scales. Because it's going to call your attention to you. Well, what I just said about Ruthla, the world is looking back at you. I never put it to the test. No one took me up on that. Yeah. Wow. Here's just a fun question from Gary. Uh, Dr. Neeland, what herbs and spices have been in your cupboard for the last 60 years? In my cupboard? Yeah. Uh, I like red pepper, so I use pepper. Uh, and that's about it for me. A lot of people like balsamic vinegar. I use some of that. Uh, I never use salt. And I never use any of these proprietary sodium-containing compounds. Uh, but I had no objection to spice. You can use whatever spice you've got if it doesn't have salt in it. One of the other comments that I get quite often, <clears throat> and I use it as a tool to, to kind of uh, in inspire comments and bring to people's attention are the Kempner weight charts. Yes. Uh, I, I have them included. Uh, I've included them in my books for probably the last 20, 30 years. And what I tell people is I put this weight chart in so that you don't feel like you're losing too much weight because you're gonna lose a lot of weight on, on the program that I recommended. And let this be of some reassurance to you that you're not too thin. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, most Dr. of the- Dr. Kepner did not, I and mean, the BMI was invented in the 1870s by Ketterle. So, you know, it's been around a long time. Yeah. 
Yeah. He did not use that as such, but I've gone back and looked at his weights and what they would do in BMIs. And they would come to a BMI between 19 and 20 for women and 20 and 21 for men as his okay. ideal. That's and I think that probably would minimize your risk of disease. And, you know, that's what I tell people they should be aiming that. It's certainly under 25, which the rest of the heathen think is the normal range for BMI. Well, those charts have been very helpful for me, and they've also been been a point of concern for a lot of folks. Am I really going to get this thin? I haven't I have been this thin since I've been three years old, they'll tell me. Yeah, you're really going to get that thin if you follow the kind of diet that uh, Dr. Kempner recommended and the kind of diet I recommend, and, and don't worry about it. You're normal. I know you don't seem to be normal. Everybody around you is used to you weighing at 80, 60 a hundred pounds more than you do, and it'll take some adjustment for them yeah. to get used to it. It's your new trim, healthy weight. But I find these weight charts to be quite accurate. Uh, as a matter of fact, I find a lot of people these days that don't even meet Kempner's weights. They're, they're even a little underweight, according to Kempner. I don't think but, he, he usually didn't object to that. <laughs> well, the thing is, he said that people should be 15% lower in weight if they had diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease. So, you know, they gave them another 15%, but, you know, I, I, again, I would put them out for reassurance. This is what you're going to weigh. Don't let it frighten you. Don't buy any expensive dresses and suits until you get down to pretty close to this weight because you're still going to lose. Well, we used to see people whose blood pressure would go at quite low and they would go to see a doctor's appointment and the nurse would take their blood pressure and say, are you okay? I mean, this blood pressure is very low. And they come back and say, is my blood pressure too low? And my response was, if you stand up, you faint and fall to the floor. And if you don't, and you feel fine, the lower the blood pressure, the better off you are. Wow. I'm looking, I just pulled up Dr. Kempner's uh, height weight chart. And so I'm curious, doctors, I am 5'5". Five, five but I was five, six, most of my life until I had, I broke my back and I lost a bone. So now I'm five, five, but I was genetically five, six. So <laughs> Dr. Kempner says a five foot five woman should weigh 112 and a five foot six woman should weigh 117. That's exactly the weight I've maintained the last 10 years, but my height has gone down. So am I overweight now by Dr. Kempner's standards? That's that's a great weight. You look so good, uh, AJ. I, I, I just don't think I could get down to one twelve. I mean, I I mean, I probably yeah, well, could, you know, but... uh, all of us tend to lose height with age. I mean, I'm down about an inch from my. Oh, should I should I knock that off my? I don't know. No one studied that one. I mean, BMI. Everyone will tell you is a blunt instrument, and I agree that it is. Okay, and and so these ideal weight charts are always going to be right. What we want to know is have you used up all the healthy places to put extra calories, that is subcutaneous fat? Are you starting to put it in unhealthy places, that is visceral fat like the liver and the pancreas and the spleen and the heart? And then finally, are you starting to put it in very unhealthy places that is inside cells, not in fat molecules itself, but in the fatty intermediates that we build up and we just have to store them somewhere I think of that, remember that old Lucy uh, episode where she and Ethel were in the chocolate factory? Oh, and one the of the chocolates best. are coming down too fast and they don't know what to do and they start stuffing them down their shirt and up this. Well, it's the same way with calories. If you've got too many calories and no place to put them, you'll put them in very unhealthy places. And those unhealthy places are not visible. We have no way to see them, even MRI scan won't tell us that. It gets us closer, but it doesn't tell us. That is inside cells on molecules. If you have all these fats, you put fatty acid intermediates react with proteins and with nucleic acids, they change how your cells work. You become insulin resistant. You get diabetes, yeah. And you'll need drugs. <laughs> and lots of them. Yeah, yeah. And we'll, we'll never catch. We got one drug that does this. Another one gives you a fungal infection. The other one will give you cancer. We got drugs. Yeah. I, I once, in, in a fit of whimsy, wrote a story about a man named Seymour Dulas. And Seymour ended up as a medical student and went to a school where the motto was, 
we diagnose disease and we treat the hell out of it. And I think that's exactly what our people are learning. Diagnose it, diagnose it accurately, and then just treat the hell out of it. And hope it never goes away and it never seems to. <laughs> Dr. Neelan, if you were doing this today, would there be anything about the rice diet you might do differently or change or add? Uh, like, the only know? thing I would add would be a much more active look at how we get people to actually do what they say they want to do. Because they all come saying they want to get healthy. They want to lose weight. Well, you know, that, that's been, as I, as I mentioned, the first book we wrote was called Making the Change. And yeah. We did everything from, you know, running seminars where we changed the, the food at the hotels, short term and long term. We took people on adventure trips all over North and South America so that we could feed them, you know, give them an intense experience and, uh, and ran this very successful hospital based program at St. Lena hospital. You know, I, I hear, here they felt when I was at St. Lena hospital, I know they felt in one way, like they were amongst real doctors and that if something went wrong, that uh, we would, we'd be able to get them better. But you know, most people, Dr. Nealon, they felt, why should I go to a hospital when I want to get healthy? There's nothing about a hospital that reminds me of getting healthy. And we, we, I would say we lost far more patients because they view hospitals as places of sickness. And so I, getting out of the hospital, the same way the hospital is one of the best moves I made. And for the next 18 years, we ran in a census that was almost twice, well, twice as high as we yeah. did the hospital. And now with our internet program, we're running the census again. And it's convenience. It's a matter of supply and support and convenience for people and giving them that, that period of time they need, to, uh, they need to make the changes. You know, some people have to come back twice. I bet you saw that at the, at the, at the, at the Kempner program. They, wasn't there a guy named Buddy Hackett that used to come every year? Yeah. And bring yes, pizzas in? Well, oh, there were a lot of people. He had a lot of celebrities that came, yes. And uh, I don't think I ever saw Buddy Hackett in person no. at all. Well, it might, might have been one of the other, uh, one of the other uh, comedians that used to talk about how he would, uh, he would order pizza for everybody uh, yeah. at, the, at the rice. You know, I'm sure you yeah. had a lot of jokers like that. That's what the experience uh, I've never had. Hackett, he did do that. Yeah, he thought that was funny. Yeah. Do you think that part of the problem with the recidivism is that people can't continue it forever? Oh, no, that they can't, but, but all the pressures of our life push us in the other direction. I mean, we live in a society that is orchestrated to push us away from this. I mean, if you want to get rich selling rice and fruit, what would you have to do to sell it? You'd have to make up stories about it. <laughs> but you won't get very rich selling it. So, if, But if you want to sell hamburgers, you have to make a burger that people will say, boy, I have to go back and get another one of them. And so they go to these exotic lengths to make food that is seductive. I mean, they, they, you know, one of my friends calls these ads food porn because they just suck you in, okay? And think, well, I have to try that. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I think that's what happens. You have to fight against it all the time. It's hard to do. But we do. And I, and I want to make that point. We have, uh, you know, we have over 4,000 recipes that are published. And uh, if we took a, a, a census of the people who are listening to the show, you would find many of them that tell you that they love the food much better than they used to, used to like their old diet. So it's, it's something that you're able to learn. You know, it's not, not that you're trapped. It's just like the people who come from Asia to the United yeah. States, when they see all these hamburgers that people are eating, you know, they're initially put off. They have to make an adjustment away from their rice-based diet. Yeah. So what you learn, you can relearn. And that's my theory is you got to figure out what makes you feel good and look good. And then you figure out how, how to do it and how to get some help doing it. Well, both of you guys have done so much to help so many people. I really enjoyed this back and forth between you guys. Please come back again, Dr. Nealon, Thank with or without job. Dr. McDougall. I think you're fabulous. You remind me of my grandfather who was a physician, not because you're old, because you're wise. <laughs> Yeah, he's, well. he's, he's got he's he's kind of got that bedside manner, doesn't he? 
Ah, oh, God, just such yeah. a, such a, just, just. What you want to sit down and hold his hand and let him tell you you're going to be okay. Yeah. Just eat rice. You're going to be just fine. <laughs> yeah. And, and white rice. I, white rice just tastes so much better to me. I eat it and I'm not afraid to eat. I'm not afraid of the arsenic. I'm, I love white rice and I cannot lie. No, right. We found some, I found something out new, new about you every time we get together, AJ. Hey, Dr. Neelan, do you personally exercise every day? Do you take walks and, like you I, I, I walk, but I don't have a dedicated walk these days. I've got so many chores that I have to do. I still mow my lawn. And I'm, I'm in the process of building a bookcase, and that takes a lot of back and forth because I'm not one of those people who can measure once and cut twice. I, I have to measure and remeasure and walk back and forth. So I get a lot of walking in, yes. That's great. Well, we, we so appreciated you coming on the show. And Dr. McDougall, thank you so much okay. for arranging this. Okay. It's my pleasure. I, you know, I, like I say, there, there are very few of us left. Yeah. <laughs> There's Dr. Yes, the dialogue myself. of the dinosaurs, right? <laughs> really? So, you, you, you know, you, we, at least we have it on, on, on recorded message now. And so people will know, yeah. even if you and I aren't able to continue to deliver the message, there might be some, some sanity in history where they look back and they say, you know, the, what we're doing is just absolutely crazy. Yeah. The sickness we're putting up with and the money we're making. And it's just, it's just insane. Yeah. There'd be some light. Just have to wait a while. Well, you know how like they have crack houses and opium dens. Maybe we could just start like more rice houses. So places that those of us that want to eat this way can get a meal like that. Well, you know, I want to point out to you that, um, uh, it's been tried several times, uh, not only with the rice houses in Durham, North Carolina, but Nathan Pritikin tried to set up Pritikin centers all throughout the country and uh, did not succeed. And you know, his programs had a lot of trouble too. It, it's hard uh, and it's because it doesn't have the money behind it. If we had the money behind it, uh, things would happen. Like there was one time when PepsiCo decided to serve low fat beans at their Taco Bell restaurants. And that went on for about five years after, after I happened to have the vice president for PepsiCo in my program. They were loved. Change is possible. We just have to have the reason to do it. And unfortunately, it's just too often money. Money from the hospitals, the doctors, the drug companies, the food industry, it, it just all points in the wrong direction. You are a more valuable commodity if you're sick than if you're healthy. Those are what the, the, that's what the math comes down to. Sick people, you can make a ton of money off of. Healthy people, you don't make any money off of. Hey, rice is cheap. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. That was a great session, Dr. Neal. Okay. Thank you for good taking it up. Thank you. And, I, and I'm okay. sure Chef AJ would like to have you back. And Oh, you know I do. Thank you so much. I, can, I, I, have, I have some ideas of what we can talk about. All right. Okay. <laughs> Thank All you, right. Dr. Neelan. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. I'd like to say thank again to Patient X, who gave me the permission to do this. Yeah. You know, it, takes, it takes guts to do that. Is and Patient told, X still alive? Is Patient oh, sure. X? Sure. That, that picture, the last picture was taken last week. I asked them to send me an update. You know, do you think Patient X would want to come on the show? Uh, well, he doesn't want to show his face, you know, and I don't blame him. But if he, he could, could, he could come on without just with voice. Uh, he, he can talk about this because I've had him do that and he can speak about what it's like and what he's had to do. Maybe I he can, doesn't uh, want to be seen. You know how like like, for example, there's there's a there's a way that we never well, have to show his face. But just I, I, send, voice. I send him the link to your program. Okay. He's, he's traveling today, so he may not look at it live, but he'll be able to look at it. Uh, you'll have it posted somehow. Yes, it's immediately on YouTube and okay. Patient X. If you're okay. watching, we don't have to ever mention your name. We can call you Mr. X and yeah. we don't have to see your face. We can arrange the technology where I, you will see me and we'll just, if you want Dr. McDougall or Dr. Neil on with you, and it will just be our, our uh, your voice. Yeah. So wouldn't that be a fabulous show? Let me yeah. see if I can open another communication channel. Are, are you open to letting people have your email address, uh, Dr. Neil? My email address? Yeah, if somebody wanted to write you, I'm sure, just like Chef AJ said, there are a lot of people who value your wisdom. And do you, would you look forward to getting a few letters? Well, I certainly don't mind people writing me, but if I get thousands of them, I may not be quick to respond. So I, I, <laughs> and I they get lost. You get a blizzard of email as soon as it's gone so long you think it's been answered and it hasn't. So if people are willing to tolerate that, they can email me. Yeah, it's easy. Frank Nealon at Gmail. There you go. 
There you go. You can get a hold of Dr. Nealon and yeah. get some. Okay. But, but with the proviso, I might not have an answer and I may not answer. So, you know. Okay. Well, but most, most people write If it's nice really people. important, you don't hear back. You can keep pestering, you know. Well, please answer me. And the reason is, is every guest that comes on Chef AJ Live for the first time gets two free bottles of, of balsamic vinegar from Modena. And you'll want to answer that email so that you can choose the two flavors I, you want. Yeah, well, that, and you, you heard about what I keep in my spice cabinet, red pepper and balsamic vinegar. So right, so this that. email, I'll send it within five minutes. Definitely, if you don't, don't answer okay. anybody else, but answer Chef AJ, because you're getting two free bottles okay. of vinegar. Okay. You both are delightful. Thank you both so much. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks. Okay, Chef AJ, see you. See you Thank soon. Thank you, Dr. McDougall. And Good thanks job. all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we start Cheek Week. Chef Robert AJ. Cheek, the New York Times bestselling author of The Plant-Based Athlete, will be interviewing plant-based elite athletes all week, starting with Nimai Delgado tomorrow, a vegan bodybuilder. Thanks everyone for watching. Take care.